Welcome to a very special episode of The Protector Season 2. I'm your host, Jason Piccolo. Today, I am joined by Rod from the GWAT Memorial Foundation. Uh, you are going to be absolutely amazed by him. I have been. I still am. He's got a great story to tell. And the organization is one that we absolutely must support. And we absolutely must spread on their message. Because the time is now for a GWAT Memorial. Thank you and welcome to The Protectors. There he is, Rod, the man, the myth. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing great, Armando. I really appreciate you taking the time and having this chat with me today. Always, brother. Always. We've been setting this up for a long time. And we finally, uh, a little COVID-19 gave us some time to get together and have an actual bona fide oh, yeah. conversation. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So the GWAP Memorial Foundation, man, uh, we were talking about it before the air and uh, we've been talking about it for a while. Uh, I've been following you on social media and everywhere else you pop up. And it is something we absolutely need. I'm a veteran of the GWAT. My wife is. Uh, she was deployed stateside for the GWAT. Um, and I don't know anybody in my sphere that hasn't been affected one way or another by this global war on terrorism. And I, I'm kind of a little long-winded right here now because the GWAT is more than just Iraq. It's more than Afghanistan. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on so you can kind of explain kind of what the vision of the GWAT Memorial Foundation is. No, I, I appreciate it. You know, I really, again, I think you, you keyed up uh, some very good talking uh, points, you know, things that we really, all of us need to address as, as not only those that serve, but, you know, fellow American citizens. Um, you know, one thing you, you said, which is, is uh, very near and dear to me is, is uh, and I'm going to talk about your wife's service real quick, where she was activated or, or served in support of the global war on terror here stateside. You know, when you say that, that kind of, I think that that right there captures the enormity and magnanimity, if, I hope I use that word right, um, of the global war on terrorism. It's not just Afghanistan. It's not just Iraq. It's not just Niger. It's not just Somalia. It's not just Syria, the global war on terrorism, um, you know, is pretty much everywhere. If it, it, in globally, you know, really, it's just kind of the 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 uh, the name of the conflict captures the 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 scope and size of it. And we have people serving in a multitude of capacities. You know, there's, um, you know, I, I like to tell stories about like my service and just just the reasons that I'm so. I'm passionate about this. So uh, during one of my deployments, we had two DEA guys. We had two FBI guys. We had some folks, some intel folks that were attached to the Special Forces Operational Detachment that I was uh, a part of going and doing everything that we did, you know, fulfilling the, the, you know, their mission set, serving alongside a Special Forces Detachment. You know, these these men and women um, were putting themselves into harm's ways just as much as we were. You know, and so when people don't really understand that or see that, it's hard for them to grasp, you know, everyone that is serving. It's not just those of us like like you, your spouse, me, my spouse, my son now uh, that are serving, but people, we have civilians, you know, that are serving. So an interesting statistic that a lot of people don't know about. So since the start in just Iraq and Afghanistan, there have been over 3,400 I'm going to say that word one more time, or that that, that uh, number one more time, 3,400 civilian casualties. That's not counting the those of us that wore the uniform. 3,400, almost half of the casualties. I mean, you could, wow. you know, almost half of casualties or, or, um, of the total number of, of uh, military. So it's, it's just one thing that, you know, one of many, many uh, educational talking points that we need to reinforce with the building of this global war on terrorism. Yeah, you uh, you kind of caught me on that one too. It's because it's true. It's 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 gone well beyond just the the service members, um, because I I know so many guys that are uh, feds and girls that are feds that have gone overseas already, and even the contractor community, and then you have the DFAS community. Everybody in there, and and thirty four hundred casualties just in Afghanistan alone is, it's yeah. uh, it's up there, man, and it's. It's touching. It's like that ripple effect. So you have 3,400, then you times that by like a spouse, a son, a daughter, 
times their grandparents. And it just, it's a ripple effect of everybody affected by it. And you look how poignant the, the Vietnam veteran Memorial is the world war II Memorial. It's somewhere where you can go. And for one, you could have remembrance Two, you could grieve and three, it's a talking point. So we don't forget who bore the, bore the wounds of this war. And it's not just the soldiers, it's not just the civilian, but it's the family members. No, exactly. And, and that's one of the things that that's why our mission set is so broad. You know, we are seeking to build the most diverse and inclusive war memorial ever built. You know, what we are choosing and, and recognizing within our mission statement is we're not just recognizing, you know, our brothers and sisters who never had the opportunity to come home. We're recognizing everybody that served. We're also recognizing the family members. We're recognizing the civilians. You know, I'm going to sound like an insensitive spouse here. So, you know, I deployed nine times, my spouse deployed six times, and my uh, youngest son uh, up to now has only deployed once. So three years ago, we were at Green Ramp um, here in Fort Bragg, and we're, me and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm watching my son, um, you know, get on the bus, you know, we, I gave her our, you know, an embrace, and then, you know, his mother gave him his brace, and I see this young man, this, uh, you know, 20-year-old, six-foot-plus, 200-plus pound paratrooper going to war all i saw was a toddler walking away yeah you know that's all i saw was my little my little hombre walking away but well that was his first deployment it was 16 between the three of us you know and like i said i sound like an insensitive husband because the most challenging deployments for me was watching my son but then also watching my spouse go to war not the deployments mm-hmm. i went on those are some of the um most joyous moments of my life were serving this nation in that capacity but the most challenging deployments for me were not the ones i deployed on was watching my loved ones going to harm's way. Yeah, you kind of got me there too. I mean, I'm like, there's so much <laughs> to this that uh, I'm so used to like just with the podcast, I'm so used to just, uh, I I get caught up sometimes. And I, I remember I'm like, I'm not just interviewing like drones, you know, the, there's so much behind every story. And you have me picturing my, my son's uh, going to be 12 soon. I pictured him. Or my daughter, she just turned, I could see her becoming like the first Navy SEAL female, but hey, that's just me. <laughs> but um, I see it and I see it in their eyes and I'm like, I just can't imagine watching them go to war. And this war, yeah. and, and you know, your your kids, are, how old is your son? Uh, my oldest son, is. he'll be 23 this month. Yeah, so almost all his life has, has been war. And it, my kids have never seen a uh, United States without war. Yeah, my Antonio, my my son, his his very first memories as a child are the events of 9-11. You know, those are the very first things that mm-hmm. as far back as he can remember was, uh, you know, the falling of the towers, the attacks and, you know, uh, those cowardly attacks against the, the towers, the Pentagon. And then, you know, that fourth airliner that went down in Pennsylvania. Um, those are his first memories. And, and since in he and him and I have had some very heart to heart talks and. And he's known, he's told me, I said, when did you know you were going to serve, you know, because people assume that because him and, you know, mm-hmm. his mother and I both served for 21 years that we were, that we forced him to do it. But we know that was, it was something he chose to do. Um, and he said that as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to serve this nation of ours. Yeah, there's so, and that's, there's so many of us out there, like, like when we were little kids, we wanted to serve and stuff. Well, now, were you a pre 9-11 when you first went in? Or yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm longer in the tooth. Yeah. So I joined the army <laughs> in uh, 1992. My first appointment was oh, okay, actually man. in uh, 93 uh, with the 10th Mountain Division to Somalia. Oh, wow, so man. Uh, I cut my teeth at 18 years old in Somalia. And, uh, you know, that was a, a blessing for me because that's where, you know, uh, the deployment to Somalia really highlighted for me. Um, what the United States military is capable of, you know, we're not mm-hmm. just hunting down bad guys and protecting national security. You know, we're really good at it. <laughs> Trust me, we're very good at yeah. that part of our job. But we also bring hope and freedom and safety and security to those who can't provide it for themselves. You know, and that deployment to Somalia um, as a young, impressionable, dumb private, you know, I'll be honest, I was a really stupid private, um, really had an impact on me. And I knew I would serve uh, this nation in uniform as long as I possibly could. Yeah, let's go into your career a little bit. Um, I know about you. You know, I did forgot that I, I forget years how long because I'm like, I can't believe 30 years has gone by since I got out of high school. Yeah. And it's just like all of a sudden one day you're like, 
holy crap <laughs> if you keep i'm forgetting. old man <laughs> i'm like I'm we're old. both old man <laughs> yeah, oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> so you you were in the special forces green Bray, and that is you know an amazing career i can only imagine um i want to hear a little bit about your career if you just want to give us a snapshot go in as much depth as you want whatever you feel comfortable about we well, want to know about okay. you yeah, sure. So um, I always knew, like, I wanted to be a Green Beret before I joined the Army. And I'd seen the, seen the movies. Uh, but when I joined the Army, that wasn't, you weren't uh, allowed to do that. So the, um, following my deployment to Somalia, and then my second deployment um, uh, with the 10th Mountain Division well, was to Haiti, Operation Hold, Uphold, Demos Uphold Democracy, excuse me. Um, you know, I had seen special forces during both of those deployments. I'd seen the SF guys, the Green Berets. They were just different. Um they seem to be doing a lot more. They were working with the local population a lot more. Uh, and they weren't wearing all the crap that we had to wear. You know, they seemed a little bit more comfortable. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, well, I, you know, I, I think I, I'm going to go to tryouts, right? So um, finally, uh, I went to selection in 1997. You know, I threw my hat in the ring. And, um, you know, with the, you know, I was fortunate enough that I prepared well enough to to be selected. Um you know, two years in the Q course to become, you know, to become a Green Beret. Um, and then spent the majority of my career in seven special forces group, um, deployed a number of times, um, you know, all over the place, cold times of Afghanistan and several deployments to Central and South America. And then uh, following my last deployment where I was injured, uh, that's when I went to go teach um, here at Fort Bragg. So I was a senior sniper for my detachment. And then I finished my career teaching as a, as a sniper instructor here at Fort Bragg. And now you're on a new battlefield, and this is a uh, yes. different battlefield. This is the one on Capitol Hill. <laughs> so this is the one I really want to talk about. I love your career. I love what you've done for our nation, for our nation, and I'm absolutely honored to be uh, associated with you. And thank you for your sacrifice. I've seen your injuries. I uh, not up close, but I, I could only imagine. But now you are on a new battlefield a new arena and this is a complex one and you don't know exactly who your friends and who your foes are but you know you do have a big support package behind you you have a whole bevy of people that want to support the foundation now why the gwat memorial foundation for you how did you get involved um well, I was, I'm not one of the founders. I, I, I really hope all of your, uh, everyone that's watching and your listeners go check out the foundation, you know, GWAT Memorial Foundation.org and learn about our history. Um, I joined the foundation in 2016. Um, and that's when we were trying to get legislation passed to get authorization to build this memorial because there's a federal law that states a war has to be over for 10 years mm -hmm. in order for a national war memorial to be built. Now, you know, they, there's no way anybody could forecast it would be in this current conflict that we're in right now. So, you know, law was written in 1986. I don't fault them for writing that law. They're, you know, our legislators and bureaucrats are doing their job. So in 2017, uh, we were able to introduce legislation that swept through the House and Senate in six months um, that allowed the foundation, um, one, to be exempt from that law. And it really officially handed us the, the standard at that point, the staff, because at any given time, anybody else could have stepped up to do it. But once we passed that legislation in 2017, we became the only one. We were the congressionally designated nonprofit um, authorized to do so. Um, so for me, um, you know, I, I was introduced to the foundation in 2016, and uh, the leadership came to me and asked if I would support. And I was like, of course, you know, by any means, you know, whatever I can do. Um, and then following the passage of the legislation in 2017, I was given the undeserved honor to, um, you know, lead the foundation. And then 2018, that's when we, when we um, start, really started to, to build a team that was capable of succeeding in this, like, as you mentioned earlier, uh, a newfound battlefield. You know, I, I, uh, I never had the best plan. I'm never the smartest guy in the room, uh, but I can bring those people together. It's one thing I, was, I learned through my 21 years in the military is how to bring people together to support an overarching mission. And that's an asset that everybody that's worn the uniform you know, has in their pocket, you know, not their back pocket, but in their front pocket. You know, it's, a, it's, it's something I wish... Everybody understood about every everyone that wore the uniform is our capability to work with individuals from such a diverse background, you know, because there is not a more diverse 
um, functioning found uh, organization in existence, the United States military, we're a broad tapestry of people from various backgrounds and socioeconomic uh, upbringings. Um, but we come together and we are really good at what we do. You know, I should say they, they are not anymore. more. Um, so in 2018, that's when, uh, you know, I, I approached a, a close personal friend of mine um, to actually join as honorary chairman. And, um, you know, he was, he was, he was right on board. So we were fortunate to welcome president Bush as on our chairman and really started to, to bring other people in that would help us on, on this current battlefield that you referenced earlier. It's definitely a battlefield, man. I, uh, I've been out in DC now for way too long. I think it's going on eight years <laughs> and, uh, I did the Hill vets thing and I, you know, I heard, uh, I did actually go meet with a whole bunch of, um, different congressmen and, and stuff like that, talking about human trafficking, human smuggling. But yeah, man, it is, uh, it's different. And getting anything passed um, is diff difficult. But if you do, like you said, you get the right team behind you, you, know, you could do anything. And you've, you've already spearheaded, you guys have gotten through the first, um, the first legal loophole, <clears throat> I shouldn't know, le loophole, you got the first law passed. What's the next thing? What's the next thing you guys need to go at? Okay, so um, we have another piece of legislation um, that was introduced uh, the day after Veterans Day on uh, November 12, 2019. It's called HR 5046, which is the Global War on Terrorism Memorial Location Act. Now, I'm going to talk about how we got to that point. So following the passage of that initial legislation, that's when we figured, you know, this we have this great idea. Um, everybody's supportive, you know, the beautiful thing about what we do in this battlefield is it's nonpartisan. There's, there's no party politics involved here. This is just about your American fighting man and fighting woman serving in our nation's longest conflict. That's what this is about. So it's a really unifying, um, mission really. It, it's, it's easy to get behind. So following in 2018, it was, I felt it was very important for us to, even with a broad, robust team that we have, again, I hope people will see who's involved with this foundation. Um, I felt it would be somewhat short-sighted of us and um, I guess arrogant to think we knew everything there was to know about this, this war, you know, like what should the memorial say, where, what should themes should be captured, um, what it should look like um, and where it should go. So um, we embarked on a, a fact-finding mission. You know, we decided to go back to the American people. So we spoke with Gold Star family members you know, those who've lost a loved one in the global war on terrorism. We spoke with Blue Star family members, those who have a uh, family member serving, like I'm, I'm a Blue Star dad now. Um, we spoke with veterans who served. We spoke with veterans that didn't serve. We spoke with faith leaders. We spoke with, um, you know, the broader base of, of the population. We spoke with people that didn't know anybody that served. And those that was some, that was a hard population to find, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, and and we spoke with active duty service members. You know, we here at Fort Bragg, you know, I'm, I'm close to the center of the military universe. I live outside of Fort Bragg and Fayetteville. So for, for three days, we, we were able to go on base and spoke with uh, peer groups uh, over the course of three days, uh, those that are still in the fight. And I'm going to talk about that group real briefly. So over the course of three days, we spoke with 67 service members. These 67 service members, we had some that had been in the Army for a year, then we had some some older hombres and, and, and ladies like myself, you know. Um, so those 67 service members represented almost 800 years of service and almost 200 deployments. So that was how we terminated this fact-finding mission. So then we went back and, and during these discussions, we pretty much wanted to find out, you know, uh, what they thought, where it should go and, and what it should look like, themes. Um, and then we compiled all the data and we created an executive summary and overwhelmingly the vast majority, everybody wants this thing to be built within the reserve. Now that led us to the current legislation. Now the reserve is the area that you would think where all the war memorials are built. That's mm -hmm. the reserve. In order for us to be built within the reserve, we need congressional authorization. You know, 2006 Congress was like, Hey, we want greater control. And again, I'm not faulting anyone for doing their jobs. That's their, that's, that's their jobs while we elect them. Um, so, okay, that's just what we have to do. You know, there's a, there's an alphabet soup of agencies that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but the American people, the American people spoke, you know, that's why we felt it easy to go back to the representatives of the American people, which are, are, are the members of the house and Senate saying, look, this is what the American people want. 
and um, HR 5046 was introduced um, by about 30 GWAT veterans who are currently serving. Uh, Representatives Gallagher and Crow spearheaded this, uh, you know, uh, spearheaded this effort, you know, and currently we're at over 60, I think we're at 62 right now, um, uh, co-sponsors, you know, we're working on, on, on moving forward and everybody listening, what they can do is they can reach out to the local representative and tell them to do the right thing and support HR 5046, because without that piece of legislation, this memorial is going to be built in an obscure part of the city. We're going to be pushed out in yeah. the fabric of the city. And given the the uh, the length of service, given the injuries that some, um, it, it would just be hard to get to, um, and we we just don't want that to happen. You know, we believe that the level of service is equal to those of all the other war memorials that are built within the reserve. So that's kind of where we're at right now. You know, you 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 hit the nail right on the head, man. It needs to go where everybody can see it. And not worth just off off yonder saying, okay, check the block. We, there's their memorial. Let them be happy with it. Now, we need it somewhere where, you know, I want to take a walk during lunch, like so many other people do, federal employees, veterans, everybody else. Um, I want to take my parents, my kids, my relatives, my anybody, friends to go see it. I want to be centrally located. That is such an important fact. Um, one thing I do want to touch on is that we need to support this. You need to contact your representative, whether that's through an email, a phone call, whatever. They actually pick up the phone. You'd be more than surprised. Not them themselves, but their staffers. <laughs> they do. Um, and they actually, mm -hmm. you know, I called a bunch of them. And I'm like, I just want to come over and talk. They're like, really? Sure. Come on in. Yeah, it's that easy. <laughs> just do it. Um, the other thing is corporate sponsorship. Because a lot of, one thing we need to touch on is this does not come out of the taxpayer's money. This is not your or my money unless I decide, hey, I want to give, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, whatever money to the organization. This does not come out of taxpayers' money. This is all funded from other sources. Am I right? No, you're exactly right. You know, and that was one thing that, that we feel we feel very strongly about. We didn't ask for any taxpayer dollars. We didn't ask for any money from the federal government because this memorial belongs to the American people. And, you know, the American patriot is going to step up and donate. You know, some of the most impactful um, donations we receive, at least for me, you know, they, they you know, they, they come into the, our post office box here in Fayetteville. We're headquartered here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um you know, we'll get like a, a $5 check written by, you know, uh, a, an elderly gentleman or lady in the, in, you know, the middle of nowhere. And you can tell they have difficulty riding and they're shaking, you know, their hands are shaking and whether they have Parkinson's or, or what have you. I, and I look at these, these donations that we get from people on a fixed income that I have no idea what status in life they're in. Um, and it, I get very emotional. You know, this, this, this project that I'm part of is absolutely terrifying it's an immense responsibility, but I, I can't see myself doing anything else uh, right now. I, I go to sleep thinking about this. I dream about this. I wake up thinking about this. Uh, my whole family is involved. I mean, it's it's a big, you know, the uh, it's a family affair, as you know, Jason. You know, you know, I, you're, 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 you're my hermano. And when I say that, I tell people all the time, you know, it's a, a thing I use. It is, I call people, you know, my familia, my hermano, mm -hmm. I'm your hermano. You know, um, I don't say that because it's a cool thing to say. I nah. say that because uh, you have my love. If you are serving your fellow man, it, you have my love. I love it, brother. I love it. Any corporations out there, uh, this would be an awesome thing to get behind. Um, one of my friends right now is writing an op-ed about corporations. So we'll keep an eye on that. And uh, Scott Husing, if you're out there watching this, uh, you know, you could use some of the, what we've talked about today for your op-ed. Because there's yeah, plenty there's, of ways to help out. Yeah, you're right. There's there's an interesting statistic. So we talk about like this is the most broad and diverse and inclusive uh, war memorial ever built. So in January of 2019, we lost seven Americans serving the global war on terrorism. Two of them were close personal friends of mine. Um, both of them were Green Berets. One was in uniform and one was not. In January 2019, seven Americans were killed. Four of them were active duty service members. Three of them were contractors. You know, during the, Pers the Persian Gulf War, one out of every 50 people on the battlefield was a civilian, a contractor, mm. under contract, yeah. some form, one out of 50. Today, that ratio is from 
civilian contractor or, or DOD civilian, however you want to, however you want to do it. Mm -hmm. That ratio has gone from 50 to one to one to one. And in some cases wow. it's two, it's two to one. You know, there's a reason 0.6% of our population serves and defends this nation so in such a magnificent way, because we have Americans right now fulfilling wartime missions that were once fulfilled by a uniformed service member, yep. which is why it's very important to me and to, to all of us to come together and recognize everybody's level of service. You know, I never look down on someone because they didn't serve in as a Green Beret. I've never mm -hmm. looked at is at a cook or uh, anyone in, in a support role is like, oh, you didn't really serve like I served. No, yeah. you're you're serving like I, you're in the theater. You're doing your job. I could not do my job without your job. So why would we choose to ignore every American that has served? We need to honor everybody. Rod, we're going to make it happen, brother. Mi hermano. I can speak a little Spanish, hey. too. <laughs> Andale. <laughs> Hey, señor, ¿qué pasó? Ese es los Estados Unidos. Usted necesita aprender al español también. Oh, that's my Spanish for the day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, brother, I appreciate you coming on today. Uh, I've learned a ton, and you've actually opened up my eyes to the civilian aspect of this GWAT and to everybody else that served. I mean, I would love to know the numbers of everybody that's just been touched on by one way or the other by the GWAT and uh, let's make this happen, brother. So let's put this up here. It's the HR 5046 G global war on terrorism Memorial location act. Um, everybody write this down, text, call, contact your congressmen, senators, and everybody else that works up on a Hill. Also go to the GWAT Memorial foundation.org. That's been scrolling across the bottom and support the organization. You know, I always tell people, Mike, if you don't have the money to help, you could also spread the message. You could write letters. You could do everything else. I, you know, I can only donate so much here and there, but I know if I could do podcasts or I could do whatever I can to help, it helps a little bit. Um, everybody else out there, spread the message. That helps so much. It's a ripple effect. Uh, if it gets in the right ear of the right person, it helps so much. Rod, any final words for the protector's audience? No, I just, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in and listening to you, hermano. I mean, really, I, I'm glad every, every, chances are everyone that's listening wants to help in some form or fashion. And I just want to reinforce what I said earlier. You know, there's, there's so many other ways to be a good patriotic American citizen. Doesn't necessarily have to be wearing the uniform. You know, mm -hmm. uh, serve your local community. If you serve in your local community or your neighborhood, you're serving your nation. And again, you have my love. So thank you all and, and Godspeed. Thank you, brother. We will talk soon. Yes.